Hi, I'm Shelly Summer, Program Manager for Weighing In at the Center for Children's Healthy Lifestyles and Nutrition at Children's Mercy Hospital. And I'm so happy to be hosting our partner spotlight today with Dr. Kevin Smith. Um, this is a really timely topic that we're going to be um, speaking about today. It's the topic of sleep. I'm sure many of you, um, as we're thinking about all the things that are going on, holidays coming up, are or may be experiencing some issues or changes in your sleep. So I really appreciate Dr. Smith spending some time with me today to talk about it. So Kevin Smith is a pediatric psychologist in the divisions of developmental and behavioral health and pediatric pulmonary and sleep medicine at Children's Mercy. And I'm so glad you're willing to spend some time with me today, um, Dr. Smith. So I'm just going to go ahead and get right into this, if you don't mind. And I'd like to start with um, why... Sleep is so important and why this conversation is so important. Well, first, thank you for the invitation. Um, people who know me know that I could talk about sleep all day, so I'm always available for that. I think it's I think it's really fascinating, and one of the reasons why um, I do what I do is because there's because sleep is so important, um, and it really is one of the few things. Um, interestingly, nutrition would be the other. I think that really touches every aspect of our life. Uh, sleep can affect your physical health in a number of ways. It affects mood. It affects um, relationships for children. It can affect academic performance. Um, family relationships additionally. So it's just, it's so important and has such an impact um, and everybody sleeps. So, uh, I mean, so it's, it's, it's one of those things that really, again, along with, along with nutrition, I'm not just saying that because I'm being, being interviewed here, but I think those two things just touch everybody's lives. Um, and so uh, it's just so important to, in my opinion, really elevate um, both of them, including um, sleep, uh, elevate them in the importance of kind of, of of what we're focusing on, because you you can reap the benefits by getting good sleep in a number of ways. Yeah, and I feel like we take sleep for granted. We don't. We often don't think about it or think about how important it is um, for us to rejuvenate, to um, improve our mind, improve our bodies, et cetera. So what are some of the more common sleep problems you see in kids? Yeah, and it really depends on, on age. So at the sleep clinic at Children's Mercy, I mean, I see uh, maybe starting as early as six or seven months up until um, uh, age 18 is our general cut off and, and some older than that. Um, so it really depends on age as to what, what I, what presentations I see. Um, so with the little ones, and I, I know we can't cover everybody today, but um, with, with the little ones and even like up until age, you know, one, two, three, or even older than that, um, one of the big issues is helping kiddos to sleep independently, um, to fall asleep and to stay asleep independently. Um, now, some families prefer to co-sleep, and in some cultures, that's really the norm, I would say, in the United States. I wouldn't call it the norm, but there are families who prefer to co-sleep, and there's nothing wrong with that. Um, over the age of one, the American Academy of Pediatrics doesn't recommend that for the little ones, obviously, because um, um, there, there, there you know, could be suffocation issues. But but other than that, um, some families choose to co-sleep. And as long as everybody's in agreement, everybody. So that means if there are two caregivers, both caregivers want that, right? And then obviously the kiddo, um, then, then, I, then go for it. Um, but many families, at least the ones that uh, that come to clinic, don't want that. And then what they want is help uh, help with kids to fall asleep independently and be able to fall back to sleep. And so with the little ones, that's probably the, the most predominant issue I have. See. Um, and then as they start to get older, you have things like nighttime fears and nightmares and how to manage those. That's actually one of my favorite. Um, it's just very interesting to see what kids are afraid of. Um, can you guess the number one fear? Putting you on the spot here. You mean nighttime when they when they wake up? Uh, yeah, like uh, 
uh, going to bed, number one fear, nightmares is where's your answer. It's it's high up there. Um, it's actually way more basic than that. And it's more primal than that. It's the dark. And the dark has, has always been number one. The dark will always be number one. Um, other fears come and go. There are movie characters that come and go. Um, uh, urban legends that come and go. Some of them actually have more legs than others. But the dark is always number one. Um, so um, really helping their kids, helping the kids with nighttime fears um, just helps to increase their ability to self-soothe and feel more confident at night and um, less anxious. And that's just going to make for better sleep. Um, as kids get older, then it gets more into kind of what people think of as insomnia, just having general problems, falling asleep or staying asleep. And there are so many, so many things that can contribute to that. It's That's one of the things I like about behavioral sleep medicine is that um, it's it's just different every day. Um, uh, right now, as you can imagine, there are certain things that are troubling people in 2020, um, COVID-19. So um, just man helping kids to manage just these radical change in schedules and um, online schooling and face-to-face -face schooling and the anxiety that that can bring or not knowing, all those things have been predominant this year, not just with kids. Uh, but with adults. So well, that, say, was, that was something I was going to say. It sounds like parents, I can imagine, are having these same sorts of anxiety mm -hmm. that kids are, which is likely disrupting their sleep as well. Well, and my goal is, um, I know that the child is my patient, but I see the family really as who I'm focusing on when it comes to sleep. Parents are better parents when they're rested. They're better partners when they're rested. They're better um, employees when they're rested. So it's just as important for me to help the caregivers get good sleep as it is for the kiddo. So um, so it ends up kind of being a twofer when when uh, when I'm meeting with the family is that I'm also addressing parent sleep issues either, which are obviously really tied with um, with their child. If their child's sleeping better, odds are they're going to be sleeping better too. So. Right. That's exactly right. And we're better humans when we get sleep and we, we good, feel better. Good, good way to jump. Yeah, that's a nice overarching. I like that. We are better humans. So about how much sleep should, and I know this is a really broad question, but should people be getting? And, you know, maybe you want to talk about it a little bit in terms of age groups. I'm assuming yeah. it's different for different age groups. Yeah, and there and there have been um, position papers on that um, uh, committees studying this, and they review it kind of every several years. Um, so, from uh, the National Sleep Foundation or SleepFoundation.org, um, you can find the research that's been done on this. But in general, um, so if you have um, newborns like zero to three months, you're looking, and these are averages, right? You're looking at about fourteen to seventeen hours. Um, and uh, in infants, kind of four to 11 months, about 12 to 15 hours. Again, nice range there. Everybody's different. Toddlers, one to two years old, you're looking at about 11 to 14. Getting up into preschool, three to five-year-olds, about 10 to 13 hours. Um, approaching school age, about six to 13 years old, nine to 11 hours. And then uh, into teen years, you know, we shoot, we hope for nine to nine and a half hours. But frankly, um, anecdotally and through research, um, teens on average are really undershooting that. And, uh, well, let's just say, I don't see the teens that are sleeping nine <laughs> to 10 hours or they probably wouldn't be in my clinic. So, um, but that's kind of, and then as we get older, we need less sleep. Older adults need less sleep than, you know, when you're in your twenties or thirties. So obviously the trend there, right. was the number drops as you, as you get older, but that's, yeah. those are ranges. They all, um, I think those are all about three hour ranges. So um, everybody's different and, and, and some, some kids may be outside of that range too, but I think most kids will fall. That's at least what the average would be. That's what we would shoot for in those ranges that I stated. So I have a couple of questions about that. When we think about sleep, there are two things that I'm thinking about. One is what are the practices that we would want to put in place to help us sleep better? Like, um, what's the sleep environment? What should it look like? And then what are those tips that you're giving to kids and families to help improve their sleep? Yeah, I think um, the environment is so important. And I kind of, um, and the way I present it, I kind of break it down into kind of 
level one um, recommendations and then higher. And so level one recommendations are things that everybody can do, um, uh, regardless of whether you have, uh, you're happy with your sleep, you're not happy with your sleep. This, this is kind of the foundation of the building blocks on where you start. So, so a lot of these are going to sound familiar. Um, one thing I've learned is you, some things you can't say too much. Uh, and even though um, they may be in the kind of um, national uh, consciousness, it's still hard to do. Um, so the first thing I think if you're a parent trying to figure out how to give your child the best um, sleep is to think about the um, ranges of hours I had. Uh, said and make sure that literally there's enough time um, for your child to even have a shot at those. Like they have to at least be in bed that long to even right to even be able to sleep that long. So, looking at a kiddo's schedule, it isn't as um, it isn't as tricky when a child is three, right? Because they don't have a job and um, they're not really going to a structured school yet, and so their schedule really depends on yours. Um, so uh, for families that may tend to skew a little later than night owls, you just have to be careful that um, for the, you know, two, three, four-year-olds that they are getting to bed early enough um, based on when they wake up to give them an adequate amount of sleep. So I think the first thing to look at is schedules. It gets a little more complicated when kids are older because they're in school and they have extracurricular activities. And, and I love that. I love when I hear kids are involved in um, either a sport or instrument or chess club or who cares as long as they're getting out there and and doing something right so you don't want to um uh push the, that part of their life away but sometimes it you have to step back and kind of look at the amount of things they're doing and say are are we allowing them to have enough time to have a little bit of wind down time and then get into bed in an adequate amount of time. And sometimes that can be a real challenge, especially with sports when uh, practices are late into the evening, things along those lines. So I'd say that's number one is looking at um, sleep schedules and making sure that there's protected time where your child has a chance to sleep. Um, the second thing would be, as you alluded to, the environment. Um, that the studies have shown that sleep environment meaning your bedroom usually, um, can have a powerful effect on whether you're going to sleep well or not. And so the basics are um, light. So you want minimal amount of light as possible. Um, now, it doesn't have to be completely pitch dark. Um, night lights are fine. I like those projector lights that uh, do shapes onto the ceiling. Uh, I think those are great. Um, uh, people get really creative with it. lava lamps. Back in the day, that was big, and it seems like it's still they're still around. Um, some, yeah, right. Some kids do. Uh, will have like <clears throat> small strings of Christmas lights that stay up all the time, or fairy lights, things like that. You can get really creative with that. And a good rule of thumb: this isn't uh, scientifically based, but a good rule of thumb is if you're in your child's bed and you can read a book, not. Uh, uh, electronic, but you can read, it's bright enough to read text. It's probably too bright in their room. So it's a good rule of thumb for parents. Um, and then sound, you, you want a relatively quiet room, but it doesn't have to be completely quiet. Some kids and adults, myself included, um, sleep better with a little bit of what we call white noise, noise that doesn't particularly have a pattern to it. So, um, they have white noise machines that literally make kind of a staticky, sound that just blends into the background. You can use nature sounds like rain or the ocean, um, even soft music, preferably if you can, instrumental. Um, it's just less engaging. So a little um, um, maybe soft lullabies or jazz or uh, classical, something along those lines. But um, another pretty inexpensive white noise machine that everybody has is a fan. Um, so it's not that it's cooling someone necessarily, it's just the sound. Um, and if you're using it for that, don't go out and buy yourself a $500 Dyson fan. We want a sound, we want a fan that rattles a little right out of the box. So get over to CVS or someplace like that, get that $14 fan that's gonna <laughs> out of the box, have a little rattle to it. That's actually what you want. Um, and then temperature sounds obvious, but um, it's hard to sleep if you're either really hot or really cold. And actually, our body prefers to for it to be a little on the cooler end. So if you're going to make an adjustment, make it a little on the cooler end. Um, the bed is really important, too. And that's one I find that people really don't think about that often. Um, the um, 
the mattress uh, industry recommends that we switch our bed out every, I think it's around every seven to 10 years. I don't know if that's based on science necessarily. What I would say is um, as a parent, uh, test your kiddo's bed every so often. Obviously, if it's a crib, you can't, but you know, if it's a bed where you can get in and see what you think. Are you comfortable? If you're not comfortable, probably your kiddo isn't comfortable either. Um, and our bed, um, how do I want to put this? Our bed tain- tends to gain weight over time. A mattress, if you kind of get what I'm saying there. Um, yeah. We, we release um skin and all sorts of things um, throughout. So so uh, kind of keep an eye on how long um, you've had the bed and test it out every once in a while. And if there start to be some spots where it's you have to really maneuver to get comfortable, well, that's going to disrupt, disrupt sleep. Um, other tips, uh, kids never like this tip. Parents love this tip. Um, a room that's relatively clean and kind of peaceful to I know it's never kids are always just like oh come on don't don't say that my parents already want me to but um, a room that's more organized and clean just tends to be more relaxing I mean that's the thing is when you walk into your bedroom you want to have kind of a stress-free relaxed response Um, now we can't all have like five-star hotel bedrooms but you don't need to really Having a bedroom that's relatively clean doesn't have to be perfect, but relatively clean at the very least, not having a bunch of stuff on the bed um, uh, is free. That's a free thing that that you can do. Um, and it really does. It really does make a difference. In fact, there were studies that have shown that um, uh, they took two groups. One group uh, slept in a bed that was had freshly laundered sheets and was made and and, you know, and then the same bed, same sheets, but they weren't freshly laundered and the bed wasn't made when they went in and group one slept better. Now, there are other variables, of course, but that's another thing that's relatively uh, inexpensive or free is to just kind of launder your sheets regularly, too. Uh, and then the final piece, and this could be a whole conversation, and this is definitely one where kids aren't thrilled um, when we talk about it. They're also very well versed and ready for me um, is electronics. Um, <laughs> and I, yeah, that's the reaction uh, because every every parent, every parent, every parent has had this conversation. And and trust me, I wake up in the middle of the night in sweats, uh, sleep sweats, thinking about screens because um no child is happy with so the request or the uh, suggestions that i generally have um uh i can have you have you experienced that shelly is that uh, something you've you've heard before with the screens yes so two things my kids in particular we used to make them they're they're adults now 23 and 24 uh, but when they were younger all the way through high school, they had to put their phones in our room at night. And that used to make them crazy. And then we always had the fight of, can I have a TV in my bedroom? No, the answer was no. We didn't even care if they were going to buy it or not. The answer was no. Mm -hmm. So I'm not commending you just because you're the host of this, but that's really, um, that that's, that's what I recommend. And I will tell you for parents that are listening and they have little kids where smartphone isn't an issue yet or, or tablet, although I have uh, many two-year-olds that uh, will be in my office and while I'm talking to a caregiver, um, can work a tablet better than I can. It's amazing. It is, it is amazing how um, that age has just decreased as far as their ability to... It's uh it, the touch screens i think are very intuitive to kids they just kind of get it even better than we do you know you want to make something bigger on a screen well to a kid yeah you just pull it pull it back so whoever invented all those little moves and things that's that was pretty smart but kids are kids are sometimes better than their parents right on uh, electronics um but the best thing you could do it's much easier to keep screens out of a room than it is to have to have the discussion to take them out. So if you start early um, and have exactly what you said, I have a friend who has a wicker basket and she walks by everybody's bedroom and they put their <laughs> electronics in the wicker yeah. basket and she charges them and they're ready for them the next day. Um, that said, 
I am also a realist. And I have also um, realized that over time, um, especially with the adolescents, it has become a losing battle. Um, it is really hard these days to at least uh, children coming to the sleep clinic to um, to get that in place sometimes because it is such a battle. And frankly, most kids have their smartphones in their room. Um, can you guess that when I say, you know, I'd like you to charge your smartphone outside of your room, can you guess the number one reason I get for why it just isn't possible? No, because I can't, I mean, I can't think of a reason why it wouldn't be possible. Well, no, it is possible, but um, uh, something that kids use their smart phones for um at night well they want to watch tv or watch screens or communicate or social or uh message or yes that is what they want to do that is not what they tell me um yeah so, I don't, what are they telling you yeah uh, because it's um their alarm and they have to have it in their room to wake up and then i get this kind of dry look on my face and i say you know um Back in the day when your mom and dad and I were kids, they had these cool things called alarm, alarm clocks. clocks. And then, they, then they roll their eyes at me. Um, but yeah, that's the number one. And the kids are ready, though. By the time they've seen me, they've had pediatricians. They've had uh, uh, family members. They've had uh, parents of other friends talk ad nauseum about this. So um, so yeah, I recommend we'll just get, get them an alarm clock and that's not the answer that they want um so I, I i've changed my recommendations over time um to just be more uh in tune with what's going on right now um like i used to say uh i really would like you an hour before bed to stop using electronics as kind of a wind down time our brain needs that um we're just not we've become a society where we're not comfortable anymore with our own thoughts and so we need distraction. Um, we don't like it when our brain has nothing coming in because for whatever reason, um, like if you look at people standing in a grocery line or in an elevator, if there's no one engaging, what's the first thing that most people do these days, right? Um, it's fascinating. An airport, I know we don't do that much anymore, but look around an airport when people are sitting down. I'd say 90% plus are, are looking down. So we don't know what to do anymore when it's quiet. Restaurants is the other place to look around and see people just staring at their phones instead of yeah. seeing with the people at their table. That's right. So everybody decided to go out together to a restaurant to sit independently. I don't know. Um, and I do it as well. And listen, I love my smartphone. And I tell my patients, uh, we didn't have smartphones back when I was 13. But if we if I did. Oh, I would have done everything in my power to try to get that phone in my room because they're great. And um, so I'm I'm for technology. I think it's improved our society, but it also there's downsides to it. And the one downside is sleep. And I think we have a lot of people with insomnia because it's just become very hard for them to conceptualize um, shutting down. You know, and our yeah. brain we're, we're not an on off switch. You can't just plug us in like. A, um, a a smartphone. We have to uh, shift from conscious state to sleep, and we have to help our brain prepare for that. And um, so, uh, at the very least, if I have someone coming in with some challenges, I, I start with no electronics in bed, um, and we work our way back. But at the number one, yeah, no electronics in bed um, is. I want to pause right there for just a second because you said no electronics in bed. You didn't say no electronics in the bedroom. So it sounds like you're starting with literally in bed. So keep your, if you have to have your phone in your room for your alarm, let the phone stay on a bedside table or on a floor or somewhere else where you can hear the alarm but not engage with your phone overnight. Is that my summarizing yeah, sort of where starting, you're starting? It's not optimal, but I'm also, yeah. I'm, you know, as a psychologist, my goal is to help people make changes in their behavior and you have to meet people where they are. Um, no, in a perfect world, depending on, you know, if I'm recommending to everybody out there, yeah, the phone shouldn't be in the room. That, that's really, that would be, that would be optimal. Um, right. And as a family, you have to have that discussion. Now, the other recommendation that doesn't always go over well with parents is, you know, um, serve as a model. 
So nobody's phone should be in their bed. And now that makes people <laughs> because most adults have their phone in their room too. So if you really want, if you really want to make systemic change, everybody puts their phone in the wicker basket. That's a great, it, it just makes it easier because kids then feel like everybody's on the same team. And, uh, uh, and I know parents can do what they want. And that's a fun part about being an adult. <laughs> you don't, you don't have another parent telling you what to do, but, uh, if you're having that problem at home, um, it goes a long way. If you, if you can join in and make it a family effort, you can make it fun. I mean, I know that sounds maybe a little corny, but maybe it's a contest. Maybe, uh, you know, maybe, um, if, if this is, something that your family could do. Maybe uh, every time someone completes a night without a phone in their room, you get a family point and all those points could equal something fun. Maybe you, you know, um, have a special dessert or, 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 or something, you know, bigger if you can swing that, but making it a family effort, I found that you have much more success. Um, Role, Role modeling is so important for everything. So not just sleep and electronics, but physical activity, healthy eating, sure, um, sure. behavior, you know, all of those things. It's really, really um, an important thing to consider. Kids watch what you do more than listen to what you say. And I think that's a, right, right, you, can't, right. you can't make that point enough. Right. Well, and in a previous institution, I was in uh, served as the psychologist in the weight management clinic for five years. Um, if you're trying to help a child uh, manage that, um, your kitchens have to has to be tight. You got to you have it. You got to you know because who who wants that um, temptation, right? Oh, right. So, uh, it really with with a lot of behavior change with children, it really does become a family a family effort. Yeah. And, find that you get the most success that way. Um, and just to close out the electronics, and again, most kids aren't don't really care about this, but this is really the two main reasons to me. Electronics are engaging. They're a reward system, really. You touch something and you get something new, and that's rewarding, and the brain likes that. And then you do it again, and it's just kind of this constant loop, right, um, that really affects, affects your brain. But the second thing is it's the light, and that's really the big issue is that light um, not to get too sciencey, but it enters our optic nerve, uh, triggers the pineal gland, which is where the hormone melatonin um, is produced, which most people know what that is. It's pretty ubiquitous and you can buy it at Walmart for goodness sake. Um, and it tricks the brain into delaying the production of that. And so your brain thinks, well, I guess it's not time to go to sleep yet. And then, so it creates this loop of insomnia. Um, and there's actually a physiological reason why. So it's not just because I'm the mean doctor coming in, um, you know, from the mountain, giving my recommendations. There really is a, there's a medical reason behind it. And that, I assume that applies to both phone screens as well as TV screens. Is that correct? Yeah, I, I always say phone because that seems to be the number one uh, at, at this point. I think phones and tablets way outpace television at this point. I think, frankly, it sounds like to me kids are bored with television. Um, but if you if you talk to kids about where they're getting their information from these days, it seems to be social media um, and YouTube. <laughs> um, and then video games would be the other category, too. So okay. um, the problem is, like, again, smartphones are great. and there are apps on smartphones that can provide free white noise you know youtube you can click on um eight hours of a rainstorm um you know it's so it's really convenient it's just it's so tempting to right to do more and so i find that i don't usually recommend a lot of smartphone apps for that very reason um yeah. it's it may be too much to expect a 14 year old or a 12 year old or a 10 year old to in the middle of the night go, well, I'm only supposed to use the rain app, so I won't look at anything else. And that I, beep comes in. It, what, what's that? That beep comes in, you I, know, your notification. Yeah. <laughs> so um, it's it's too bad because I think there are things on there that could be helpful, but uh, yeah. But yeah, um, and that's, I think this is a topic most people have heard, but it really, it really is important on so, on so many levels. So parents continue to fight the fight. Um, I know, yeah. I know, and, and kiddos will keep chipping away. They're going to keep 
coming at you, but um, it's a fight worth fighting. So, well, and that's an excellent point. You know, meet people where they are, start chipping away. Don't feel like you have to be perfect from the right. get go. But yep. um, so to summarize a little bit about what we've covered today. So sleep is important because it affects mood, academic performance, a variety of um, um, issues that impact your health. And in order to address that, we want to think about making sure to schedule enough time for sleep. Think about the bedroom and the environment. So minimal light, quiet, doesn't have to be completely silent. What's the temperature like? What's the um, room and the mattress like? Anything else? To cover resources, I think about um, what are the resources you'd recommend for parents? Yeah, you know, um, one of the advantages of doing these uh, meetings like this is that I can look on a screen and uh, and be able just to uh, bring up some because I, I pulled together some of my favorite ones. I, there are so many resources out there, and I find that um, Healthcare providers, maybe psychologists specifically, love resources. And so we'll give you a, a plethora of, and it's like, where do I start? I've really been trying to, in my practice, change that a little bit and just give a few that I like, that I've vetted and that I like a lot. Right. So if I had to recommend a couple books, and these can all be found on Amazon or other booksellers and um, aren't very expensive. Um, in fact, you can get them. I'm a big fan of used books. It's just books, you know? They still work. Um, I agree. The, the two I would recommend um, would be Sleeping Through the Night. And that's by um, a psychologist, Dr. Jody Mendel. Emma's and Mary, I-N-D-E-L-L. So Sleeping mm -hmm. Through the Night by Jody Mendel. And then um, the second one is um, Take Charge of Your Child's Sleep. There's a longer piece to that, but if you just look that up, but take charge of your child's sleep, the all-in-one resource for solving sleep problems in kids. But well, um, yeah, if you send those to me, Kevin, I'll make sure that they are included in the note oh, underneath this conversation so people can just quickly and easily click okay. on the links to them. Yeah. And that's by doctors. Um, Owens and Mendel is also on this book too. And then I have, um, there are, Many websites out there that you could go to. Um, and, and I think that's great. And that's also a problem because it's hard to sift through all of those. But my easily my favorite website um, for parents with kids under, I would say, under the age of like eight or nine um, is called babysleep.com. Pretty easy to remember. Babysleep.com. It's a little bit of a misnomer because it's not just for babies, but it's a it's a catchy name, right? Um, and it's a website that was created by um, a couple of psychologists, uh, uh, board certified in behavioral sleep medicine like myself. Um, and then they invited psychologists across the globe and some um, medical doctors as well, all who have a um, laser focus on sleep, right? And um, it's full of um, videos and uh, resource recommendations and texts about pretty much any question you could you could think of. Um, and it's really well indexed and really easy to use. And you can go on there and know that these recommendations are all science-based, um, all empirically supported treatments. Like you can really rely um, rely on it. I'm I'm part of the, the Pediatric Sleep Council who is responsible for the content. I don't get anything for that. Um, but I'm really proud of it because it's a it's just a, a wonderful website. So babysleep.com I would recommend. Okay. And we'll include all of those again in the notes um, for this session. Great. So I wanna I want to thank you so much for helping us as we promote healthy lifestyles um, through Fitastic, our one, two, three, four, five Fitastic message and on our Fitastic website. That's F I T T A S T I C dot org. We'll include these resources up there as well. Um, I so appreciate you taking the time to talk with me today. Um, Kevin, it's been really fantastic for me and I hope for other people who get a chance to look at this. I do want to, I do want to wrap up with one final thing. And I know this because I know you, but I want, I want you to speak a little bit about sleepyhead beds because there may be people who are watching this that may not have great access to getting a new mattress. And I think it's a wonderful organization and a wonderful way to help improve people's sleep for everybody. 
regardless Absolutely. of your that's, that's great. Yeah. So I used to be um, so I was a on the board of an organization called Sleepy Head Beds um, for years. Um, you know, we have to rotate off so that new people can get in. But it's a, so it certainly wasn't because uh, uh, of uh, me me not wanting to be on it. But you know, you need new people. Um, but Sleepy Head Beds is a is a nonprofit organization in Kansas City whose sole purpose well, there's two. One, I get chills kind of when I talk about it because it's such a good like literally it's such a great organization. Um, their goal is to get beds to kids that that don't have them. And you would be shocked as to the number of children who are sleeping um, either uh, on a pallet on the floor or in a lounger or a love seat or something like that because their family cannot afford a beds for, for everyone. So um, sleepyhead beds uh, takes, gent- it takes gently used beds um, sanitizes them, make them sleepy head uh, bed uh, perfect, and then they're given to families um, in need. Um, so that's goal one. And goal two is kind of a byproduct. All these beds don't end up in landfills. And um, and beds actually, and um, so they take beds and then the frames too, um, are uh, a lovely area for um, vermin to live. So when they're in land, and they don't compact. So when they're in landfills, they really cause a problem. So um, so if you were interested in, if you had a bed that's gently used and you were interested in donating it, all you'd have to do is go to sleepyheadbeds.org. So that's sleepy, H-E-A-D, B-E-D-S dot org, just like how it sounds. Um, and they made it really easy on their main page. It says, um, donate a bed and you click it and you put your information in, they give you a call and they talk about how to do that. If you need a bed, um, you can also go on that on that website and get more information as well. Um, and I think, how many beds are we up to at this point? Um, I think we're over 10,000. Um, wow. Yeah, and I'm... I should know this number and I don't, but you know what? I can go really quickly because I want to get that right. Um, but it's it's just a wonderful organization. And thank you so much for asking about it. Um, because well, I think just like you said, for people who are looking to get rid of one and don't want to just throw it in the trash, um, it's valuable. And I think for people who are in need of one, it's valuable as well. So. Yeah. Thanks for sharing that. Thanks for being a part of that. Uh, I know you talk about it frequently in in meetings where where yeah. you and I are both um, participants. Did you find that so, number? Seventeen thousand. Whoa. Seventeen thousand. And because I'm a geeky psychologist, I wanted to calculate how many, like on average, how long someone would have a mattress that we donated, and how many nights. Because that's just who I am. It's my training. I can't help it. That equals approximately 3.5 million nights of good sleep. Wow. 3.5 million. Okay, now, that's, that's an impressive I number. I know. And um, you could also donate your um, your hard-earned money, too. They, remember, we're non-for-profit. We solely exist on, don- uh, on donations. So um, if you don't have a bed, but you're like, wow, I'd really like to, you know, for a few dollars, um, I mean, basically for 50 or $60, you're giving, you're giving a kid, like, literally thousands of nights of sleep. So Yeah. Excellent point. Well, I think that's it. That's a great way to end this conversation on a high note. So thanks again. I so appreciate your time today, Kevin. This was fantastic. And I hope our uh, listeners appreciate it as well. We'll include the resources that you talked about, uh, both in the notes for this video, as well as on our website, again, fittastic.org. Thanks. Thanks for your great work. Keep it up. And we'll see you soon. Well, thank you so much for the invitation. I enjoyed it. Take care.